Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, students and other people of the new generation in Norway and the Netherlands and in other countries as well. A warm welcome to this meeting about the future of the Arctic, that special but also vulnerable region where already such immense changes are taking place as a result of global warming. This meeting is organized by the Norwegian uh, Embassy in the Netherlands uh, because of the new Arctic policy that was uh, published last Friday by Norway. Uh, the embassy asked me to host this meeting. I'm Helene Ecker and I work as a journalist on climate change at the NOS Journal and that is the main uh, news program on public television in the Netherlands. Uh, we have a number of uh, special guests this afternoon, uh, representatives of youth organizations. We are in touch with Norwegian people above the Arctic Circle. And uh, I speak with the Norwegian ambassador uh, to the Netherlands board, Ivar Svensson, and with an important Dutch official on polar affairs, Liz Terkuile, and they join me here in the studio. Welcome to you both. After that, uh, at somewhere around uh, half past two, we want to start with a panel discussion. And just after three o'clock, people in the audience can ask questions to all the participants. I understand that people are watching this, for instance, from Finland, Sweden, uh, also from the United States and Russia. So uh, I would like to welcome you uh, to this meeting as well. Uh, if you have a question or a remark, you can leave that in the live chat of YouTube and we will try to answer some of them at the end of this uh, webinar. Of course, uh, you can also indicate to whom you would like to ask uh, your question. Now to start with, uh, I would like to ask Marije Tempel um, to give us a quick sum up of the changes in the Arctic. Marije Tempel is a board member of the Arctic Explorer Foundation and uh, she traveled twice to Svalbard, in uh, the Netherlands we still call it Spitsbergen, um, and she traveled twice there for her masters at Groningen University, so she has seen some of the changes with her own eyes. Marije Tempel, um, welcome, uh, uh, please go ahead. Marije. We'll only shortly touch upon a few current changes in the Arctic, um, and the information is mostly from uh, research by NASA, Yale University, and the Arctic uh, Center in Groningen. So the Arctic is one of the most rapidly changing regions on the planet, and it's warming about two to three times faster than the rest of the globe. Uh, the thickness of the Arctic ice in September has been reduced by 40% since 1980. The number of square kilo kilometers of Arctic sea ice has dropped from 7 million in 1980 to 4.3 million today. And each year we keep seeing uh, new record high temperatures being set and new records of low sea ice extent, uh, something that we will also see in the video that we will watch after this. Um, so, and disappearing sea ice has a lot of indirect effects. It's this big protective blanket of ice uh, that sits on the Arctic Ocean. Uh, it reflects the sun, the sun's heat, um, but it also isolates the cool atmosphere from the warm ocean below. Uh, and if you start melting away this, this protective blanket of ice, you're going to warm the atmosphere even more. Uh, and it's going to affect temperature, winds, and weather. So this is not just in the Arctic, but it will happen globally. Uh, so you always have to remember what happens in the Arctic will never stay in the Arctic. There won't be any borders uh, uh, when, when, when it goes about the consequences of climate change. Um, so I just want to give a short example, like the rapid thawing of permafrost uh, has also many indirect effects. There are an estimated of 1400 gigatons of carbon frozen in permafrost, making the Arctic one of the largest carbon sinks in the world. Uh, that's about four times more than humans have emitted since the industrial revolution and nearly twice as much as is currently contained in the atmosphere. So according to a recent report, 
a two degrees Celsius increase in temperature expected by the end of the century will result in a loss of about 40% of the world's permafrost by 2100. And I, I still sound super enthusiastic because I just love to talk about the Arctic, but it's, it's pressing numbers that, that I'm, I'm talking about. And I'm just super amazed by the interconnectedness uh, of the Arctic ecosystems. They are amazing to, to do research about and to read about, but it makes it also impossible to isolate a problem like the uh, permafrost, for example. So you will, you will always have this huge domino effect. When one thing happens, something else will happen as well. And um, I'm not only talking about ecological consequences, but I'm also talking about the effects for politics, economy and society. So when we will look at the video that you will um, shortly introduce after this, uh, I want to ask everyone, wherever you are right now, try to, to connect everything you see in the, in the video to your personal environment and your personal life, because at the end, it will be connected with the things that are happening uh, in the Arctic right now. So I will leave it by that, but thank you for listening. Okay, well, thank you, Maria, and we will speak to you later this afternoon. Okay, now I want to show you indeed uh, the, um, the, a recent news item that I prepared for the NOS Journal, uh, that is the, the news program on public TV in the Netherlands, um, about the situation in the Arctic in recent months. Um, maybe we can watch that right now. Al wekenlang ligt er extreem weinig ijs op de oceaan bij de Noordpool. Normaal gesproken groeit het ijs in het najaar weer flink aan op weg naar de winter. Maar dit najaar is anders dan alle andere sinds de metingen begonnen. Dit is bijvoorbeeld zeeijs in de maand oktober 1980. De afgelopen 40 jaar is er drie kwart verdwenen. Impact op het ecosysteem is volgens onderzoekers groot. Dat het zeeijs broos is, merkten de wetenschappers die begin dit jaar naar de Noordpool vertrokken voor expeditie Mozaïek. Bij 35 graden onder nul deden ze onderzoek naar het klimaat. Tijdens de expeditie in Hartje Winter gebeurde er iets vreemds. Het ijs scheurde, vertelt Jacqueline Stevels die erbij was. Dat, dat het ijs gaat schuiven, ankerlijnen die knappen, uh, mensen worden onmiddellijk teruggeroepen van het ijs. Nou, dat zegt eigenlijk dat het ijs toch dunner is dan we uh, hadden gedacht en ook vooral dynamischer is. En door hittegolven afgelopen zomer in Siberië is dat zeeijs nog verder gesmolten en groeit het op dit moment ook amper aan, zegt polonderzoeker en weerman Peter Kuipers Munneke. En dat heeft ervoor gezorgd dat het zeewater heel warm is geworden en de hele grote rivieren in Siberië, die hebben ook heel veel warm water geloosd in de Arctische Oceaan. En daardoor gaat het opvriezen heel erg langzaam op dit moment. De afgelopen 40 jaar is het polijs voor drie kwart gesmolten. Dat proces gaat gestaag door. Dan zit je over 14, 15 jaar ongeveer op nul zeeijs in het Noordpoolgebied in de zomer. En hebben we dus een volledig ijsvrije Noordpool. Volgens het nieuwe onderzoek komen er hierdoor meer algen die CO2 kunnen opnemen. Maar de keerzijde is dat het ecosysteem van de Noordpool drastisch gaat veranderen. Nou, dat gaat dan niet alleen maar over ijsberen, maar het gaat ook over walvissen, heel veel vogels die afhankelijk zijn van de, van de vissen die uh, uh, verbonden zijn aan het ijs. Anders dan misschien gedacht is er geen direct effect van het smeltende zeeijs op de zeespiegelstijging. Uh, this item was uh, broadcasted on November 6th, so uh, just a few weeks ago, about the fall in the Arctic. Of course, the Norwegian Arctic is just a part uh, of the Arctic, but how does the local population, who lives all the way up north, uh, experiences these uh, types of uh, climate change? We get a short comment on that uh, by Anja Maria Niste Keskitalo. There you are, uh, Anja Maria. Uh, she grew up and uh, lives in the north. Anja Maria, please, um, you can start now. Thank you. Um, yeah, we experienced some warmer weather. I'm not a climate expert, but uh, I've experienced the summers in my hometown of Godegeno as uh, the last few years as much warmer than and nicer than I remember them being from my childhood, 
when there were very few actually sunny and warm days. Uh, but those who might uh, observe more climate change than I do are uh, those who spend uh, their work days outside, like uh, Sami reindeer herders who experience more warmer winters and uh, more rainfall and uh, have, have to, um, uh, they have to expect more uh, extreme weather events in the future, like for example, last winter, there were an unusual and extreme amount of snowfall in Northern Norway, which created a big uh, crisis for Sami reindeer husbandry because the reindeer couldn't access food through all of the snow and they had to transport uh, supplementary food to the reindeer by helicopters. So uh, those are some recent uh, experiences. Okay, well, thank you, Anja Maria. And uh, I'll talk to you uh, later too this afternoon. Uh, may I now introduce uh, to you Bort Ivar Svensson, Ambassador uh, of Norway to the Netherlands. Mr. Svensson, hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, maybe my first question, um, what do you think are the main challenges for Norway when it comes to the Arctic? I think the uh, information we've just uh, been given uh, shows um, uh, what is the, the, the uh, biggest overall challenge, uh, and that is how we as a country, as an Arctic country, uh, we see here uh, on the map the location uh, of Norway. Uh, and of course you see that uh, a large part of our land territory is located in the Arctic, uh, a large part uh, of our territorial waters and our economic zone in the ocean is also located in the Arctic. Uh, Norway has the uh, sovereignty over the Arctic archipelago of Svalbard, where Spitsbergen is the biggest uh, island. So we are clearly a very Arctic nation, uh, and, um, and uh, the changes that we're seeing at the Arctic, uh, in the Arctic at the moment uh, concern us uh, very much. Uh, for a lot of uh, our population, the Arctic uh, is, is our home. Uh, we have... Uh, just uh, over 400,000 uh, people living in the Norwegian parts of, uh, of the Arctic. Uh, so uh, so um, this uh, is an area of utmost uh, both strategic and national importance uh, for us. It's much more, much more people than I uh, would have expected. Yes, a lot of people are surprised uh, uh, by this, by the fact that basically 10% of the total Norwegian population lives uh, in, in the Arctic. But as I said, this really, I think, underlines uh, the importance that the Arctic has for us as a, as a state, as a country, and as uh, a nation. Uh, we have a common border with Russia uh, in the uh, northeast, as you can see on the map, and that also presents us with uh, a number of both opportunities and, and challenges that I'll, I'll come back to, uh, to uh, later. But I think to get back to your question, what is the main challenge for us uh, in the Arctic? The main challenge for, for us, I think, is to deal with climate change and deal with the other changes uh, in a way uh, that enables uh, our people to continue living in the Arctic and to continue uh, having good homes uh, there. And, and this is one of the main issues that is addressed in the white paper to Parliament that was, uh, was published just uh, last week. Yes, we, uh, this, this new uh, policy on the Arctic mm -hmm. of your country, can you please give us some, give us some uh, key points of that? Yes, yeah, so I'll give you a few key points. Uh, first of all, this is a huge document. It's almost 200 pages long. And again, I think that says a lot about the importance that the Arctic has to Norway. It deals with basically all uh, different areas of, uh, uh, of life uh, and, uh, and uh, society uh, in the Norwegian parts uh, of uh, the Arctic. In some areas, it's quite detailed. Uh, a lot of it deals with Norwegian domestic policy. Again, because uh, uh, this is uh, our territory and these are our, uh, our, our um, uh, territorial waters that we, we are talking about. But there are, uh, to start with that, uh, two chapters that deal with uh, climate change and international cooperation and security uh, policy. We saw in the introduction uh, a very clear um, presentation of the fact that climate change is not something that is coming, it is not something that is imminent. Climate change is there and climate change is real. So the chapter that deals with climate change, it gives a very, I think, good and, and detailed description uh, of, uh, of uh, of how climate change uh, is seen, how it is experienced, 
uh, climate change is seen as, uh, as was uh, said by our participant from, uh, from Kautokaino. It is seen very directly by reindeer herders in their everyday life. It is seen by Norwegian fishermen who, who have their, their livelihoods uh, in the oceans. They see it in the sense that certain types of fish stock that were dominant in the Arctic waters some years ago, these fish stocks uh, are now being forced further north because there are other fish stocks coming in from the south, and so it changes the, the dynamics, the biodiversity in, in the oceans. This is a very clear example of, of the climate change that is, that is described in, in the white uh, paper. Uh, the white paper also talks about other consequences of climate change, uh, such as, uh, for instance, uh, natural disasters. Uh, we see now in the north uh, far more than we did a few years ago forest fires. Mm -hmm. uh, we see uh, uh, more landslides. Uh, in Svalbard, for instance, this has become quite a problem in, in recent years. Uh, we see avalanches. So there are very clear challenges there that are, again, quite, uh, quite well described in, in the white paper and where the white paper also lists different uh, ways that we can, can uh, uh, deal with and, and mitigate these, uh, these uh, challenges. Uh, one thing that is incredibly important when it comes to chi climate change is to have as much uh, scientific uh, information as possible. We need a lot of research. Uh, and the white paper states very clearly that the Norwegian government will make sure uh, that we set aside enough money uh, to universities, uh, to, to um, uh, scientific institutions, so that they give us uh, as a government, they give our politicians the necessary information uh, so that politicians can, uh, can take the right uh, decisions. So uh, this, uh, this uh, climate uh, change uh, challenge is, is very clearly described, and as I said, uh, I, I think it also addresses what we can do to, to, to meet them. Um, we um, I understand that you also brought a little uh, movie about the region that we are uh, talking about right now, the northern part of uh, Norway. Yes, that takes us to, to uh, another part of, the, of this strategy, which, or not the strategy because it's not a strategy, it's a white paper, yeah. but to another important part of the white paper, and that is, uh, is the life uh, of all the people in the north of Norway who have the Arctic as their home. And I think this presents a different uh, reality of the Arci Arctic, which is uh, just as important as, as the climate change issues that I just uh, uh, talked about. We can, can see the video now from the city of Budo. Okay, this was a, a nice movie, for not in Corona time, <laughs> uh, I think, made. But uh, can you tell us, what does it show us? This shows us the city of uh, Bude, which is the second largest city of northern Norway. Uh, we are very happy that uh, Bude won the bid to become the European um, capital of culture for 2024. And 
what I really like about this video is that it shows the, uh, the, 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 the vibrant cultural life of, of uh, northern uh, Norway, which is also an important aspect of the, of the government's white paper. It talks a lot about uh, the rich culture that we have in northern Norway, the different cultural institutions, whether they are theaters or orchestras or, or, um, uh, or bands uh, or, or whatever. So uh, culture is something that we attach a lot of importance to when it comes to our northern uh, policies. I would like to, to mention in this regard that uh, Northern Norway is a multilingual area. Next to the Norwegian language, we have three different Sami languages uh, in Norway. Uh, they are still spoken in the north uh, uh, of Norway, and the white paper also underlines the, uh, the important efforts that are undertaken to protect and promote the Sami uh, languages, which form a very uh, rich and important part of, of Norway's cultural uh, uh, heritage. Uh, and. Um, uh, this, uh, I think, brings me also to, to say a little bit about education, uh, which is important uh, for us domestically, the need to ensure that we can provide everybody uh, throughout Norway, also in the north, with, with good education, and for the Sami population, education also in the, the, the Sami uh, languages. Yeah, I can understand that. Now, uh, in the invitation to the meeting of today, uh, the Norwegian embassy writes uh, decisions uh, taken today will be of great importance for the future development of the region. Uh, the youth will eventually face the positive and or negative consequences of today's policies. Now, could you please give an example of the consequences that current uh, decisions can have on the future of uh, young people? I think the Arctic, more than any other region in the world, shows how important it is that politicians uh, listen to and take advice from young people, because young people are the future. Young people will have to live uh, with the future. Now, when the Norwegian government elaborated this, this uh, white paper, uh, they appointed a youth panel of, of 50 youths who uh, provided a lot of input to uh, the white paper, and they also published their own uh, conclusions. Uh, again, uh, we see that uh, climate changes uh, are imminent. We, as a, as a country, are very, uh, uh, very, very um, adamant that we want people to still enjoy good lives in uh, northern uh, Norway. So it's, it's uh, very important that, uh, that the voices of, of young people are heard so that uh, our politicians can make the best decisions possible that uh, consider both uh, climate change and the need for the, the local population but, but to have a good economic uh, basis for their lives. Yeah, but I is there maybe a concrete um, uh, uh, a possible, uh, how do you say that, uh, a concrete thing uh, of, of, of something that really affects people in the future? I think the, uh, uh, the, the um, uh, presentation that we heard initially from uh, from uh, Anja Maria was very mm -hmm. good. She talked about how uh, the, the concrete lives and livelihoods of the Sami people, the reindeer herders, uh, are affected. Uh, this uh, affects obviously the, the, the young uh, reindeer herders, and I think that is one concrete example of, of how how uh, we need to make sure that. Uh, uh, that their voices are, are, are being heard. Are heard, yes. Norway has recently uh, offered new oil exploration blocks in the Arctic, uh, and it led to criticism from uh, environmental groups. How does this decision fit, uh, fit in with concerns about climate change? Mm -hmm. I think, uh, for one thing, it's very important to emphasize that, um, yes, the Arctic is the region in the world where climate changes are most visible. That does not mean that uh, climate change there is caused by activities in the Arctic. In fact, it mostly isn't. It's caused mainly by activities elsewhere uh, on the globe. Uh, I'd also like to, to stress that uh, for Norway as uh, a nation, uh, of course, a lot of attention is being paid to uh, energy-related issues. Uh, basically, all of our uh, consumption of electricity comes from hydropower, which is very developed in Norway. The government, and this is also clear in the white paper, is doing a lot now to promote uh, new uh, alternative sources of energy, whether it's wind power, solar power, or other types of, uh, of uh, power. And of course, uh, it goes without saying that for Norway as a country, the oil and gas reserves that we have in the North Sea and also in, in the northern sea areas have been incredibly important for Norwegian uh, welfare. Uh, 
Uh, I think what the government is trying to do is to do several things at once. We are definitely doing our bit to promote uh, new sources of energy. I think uh, Norway probably has uh, uh, one of the highest percentages of electric cars, for instance, uh, in the world. But we are also an oil and gas producing nation and we will continue uh, to, to be so. Uh, I think what we intend uh, to do uh, in that business is to make sure that, uh, that um, uh, technology is advanced, is developed quickly, so that the, uh, the exploration and exploitation of oil and gas can be done with as little environmental damage as possible. Uh, but uh, it's certainly not in the, uh, on the agenda of the Norwegian government to phase out the uh, oil and gas uh, exploration uh, yet. Not yet, no. no, but it has to be phased out in 20 or 30 yes, it, years it, it, to come. Yes, it will happen I eventually, yeah. and I think that's another important thing from the perspective of the government, is that this is done gradually and uh, with careful uh, planning. No. Uh, we also look at this from a global perspective, and we know very well that uh, the uh, d global energy situation is such that there will be demand for oil and gas for, for quite some time to come, and I think... It is definitely in the interest of the world to have a country like Norway that does this as, as, uh, as, as uh, carefully as possible uh, because oil and gas will be exploited uh, regardless also by, by uh, other nations where uh, perhaps these considerations are not as, uh, uh, as high on the agenda as it is uh, for us. A uh, final question for now. Uh, is Norway, you think, uh, getting enough understanding from the outside world, for instance, the EU, uh, for the complicated decisions uh, to be made about the future of the Arctic? For Norway as, a, as an Arctic nation, it's incredibly important to inform uh, other countries, inform the global community about uh, what the situation in the Arctic is for us, since the Arctic is our home. So that's al always something that we, uh, that we spend a lot of resources on, on uh, and time on. Um, the, um, the, 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 um, sorry, I got carried away. Uh, can we get back to your well, question? My, my question was, <laughs> if uh, Norway is getting enough understanding from the outside world for this rapidly uh, changing area, uh, Yes, in, we in see the that there is a lot of attention globally for what is going on in the Arctic, and that's good, that's necessary, because climate change requires global solutions. It's very important for Norway that we cooperate closely with other countries in Europe, with the Netherlands, with the US, with Russia, with China, uh, with Singapore on, on climate change uh, issues, because we need to find global solutions. So we definitely want that interest. We also see that there are, in the global debate about the Arctic, there is a number of myths at the moment uh, that we need to refute. There is a myth, for instance, that the Arctic is a, a, a region where there is no governance. Uh, uh, that, is, that is a myth. That is uh, not the case. Uh, the territory in the Arctic is, uh, is of course, governed uh, uh, on land by the, the, uh, the different Arctic uh, states, and, and the, uh, the sea areas uh, are mainly also attributed to, to different uh, Arctic uh, countries. So we have governance structures, we have the Arctic Council, so, so that is one myth that we uh, would uh, always like to, to uh, refute. Okay. We already got a question, but we will wait a little bit with that, uh, because I first would like to ask a few questions to uh, Lister Kuile. She is a senior Arctic official at the Arctic Council on behalf of the Netherlands. Uh, welcome to you too. Um, maybe uh, I don't think everybody understands that yeah. immediately. Could you please first give us an idea of what the interest is of the Netherlands in the future of the Arctic? Yes, of course. And first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a true pleasure to, to be here. Uh, as you surely know, the Netherlands is, is not an Arctic country, although we were on the map, I just noticed, but not <laughs> within the Arctic Circle. Um, but we do have a strong connection uh, to the region, and our ties go, way al uh, go, go back a long time uh, to, the, to the late 1500s when um, Willem Baren started an expedition in search of the Northern Passage, so a shorter sea route uh, to China, um, all for trade purposes, of course. Unfortunately, he did not find it um, because the sea route was uh, back then still completely frozen. Um, uh, but anyway, he, he did find um, uh, Spitsbergen or, or Svalbard. Um, uh, but apart from that, the way we as the Netherlands uh, look to the Arctic is that it's um, uh, a region that has a unique value to uh, humankind and to the ecosystem uh, Earth. 
And uh, as we just heard in the other presentations, the area suffers to a large extent from climate change and um, also global warming leads to ice loss and puts pressure on, uh, on biodiversity. Um, and we see it as our joint responsibility to make sure that the Arctic's uh, value will be maintained. Um, but apart from that, the developments in the Arctic also have direct consequences for the Netherlands. Take, for instance, the sea level rise. About 35% of the Netherlands is below sea level. So when the poles melt, this has a direct consequence for the Netherlands. Um, and apart from that, there are uh, the weather con uh, conditions, uh, the weather systems of, of the Arctic and the Netherlands are, are, uh, are connected. There are changes in biodiversity uh, and also shifting economic opportunities coming up. Um, so that is why uh, contribu contributing to polar research and to international uh, cooperation also serves a direct Dutch interest. Yes. Now, you heard the ambassador tell about the new uh, Arctic policy of Norway. Um, uh, can you respond to that? Yes, so um, unfortunately my Norwegian is not that good that I could <laughs> read the 200 pages in full and understand it. But through Go Google Translate I, I already noticed a few uh, things. So my first impression is that it's a very well uh, balanced uh, strategy and that it, uh, uh, that it came to light uh, uh, um, uh, when, when there was a huge um, um, uh, consultation going on both inside and outside the government and the ministries. Uh, so that is good to hear. Um, I also see that the emphasis lies on the people that live in the Arctic. Um, and uh, for them it's of course very relevant that uh, the Arctic uh, is, is being uh, d developed, so that the region is being developed. So I think that is very good. And I also notice there is uh, attention given to climate change. Um, uh, and the importance of implementing Paris and the Green Deal uh, is, is mentioned, um, and also the importance of international cooperation and um, uh, research. Um, apart from that, I, I also read something about security and uh, safety, uh, but this is only my, my first impression, and I'm very much looking forward to, to read the full uh, uh, Norwegian the full white document. paper. Yeah. I always say strategy, but it is a white paper. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, not only Norway uh, came with a new uh, policy, also the Netherlands will, in a few days or weeks to come, uh, a new uh, uh, strategy. Um, uh, the last one was five years ago, I believe. Can you already uh, give us a hint of what is going <laughs> on in that uh, document? Maybe a little uh, hint. Uh, yes, the plan is indeed that, that the new strategy uh, for 21 until 25 will come out before Christmas this year. Mm -hmm. um, and it still um, uh, has to be adopted by our cabinet and it still has to be presented to our parliament. So I can uh, only give a, a, a sneak peek uh, or a tip of the iceberg. And um, <laughs> So as you might know, as the Netherlands, we, we uh, don't have uh, uh, only an, an, an Arctic strategy, but we tend to connect the Arctic and Antarctica. So we have a polar strategy, and this will be also the case this time. Um, and what will also be the case is that the three themes of the current polar strategy, and those themes are sustainability, international cooperation, and uh, scientific research, they will remain uh, three important pillars in the new strategy as well. Um, and especially uh, sustainability will remain uh, a top priority for the Netherlands. Um, and of course, um, there will be more attention given to uh, combating climate change. Um, more than in, than in the previous one. Yes, it will be woven through the, the, uh, throughout the whole strategy. And this is different than in, in, in the current one. Okay. Um, Okay, and, and the Netherlands conducts a relatively uh, a large amount of research in uh, both polar region, uh, b uh, regions. This involves innovative research as well as monitoring current developments. Uh, do you think the Netherlands, uh, uh, scientists of course, uh, should be involved in both? So innovative research as well as monitoring? That's an interesting question. Um, so I think our science is not so much big in volume, but it is very big in impact. Uh, I, I, I hear all the time that it's being quoted a lot. And it has a very large uh, number of citations, so that's very good to, to, to notice. And to answer your question, yes, I think it should be uh, um, a mix. Um, I think that um, uh, innovative science, um, 
to name a few uh, examples, uh, remote sensing, uh, making use of big data, uh, new technologies, but also there are uh, new concepts like citizen science, where citizens are taking along with the scientists and then um, it, it gets a whole new per pers uh, perspective on, on, on science. And this was, uh, for instance, being done on the, on the huge uh, Dutch Arctic ex expedition, mm -hmm. uh, the SEIS expedition is being yes. called, uh, and they uh, took citizens along. And this, uh, unfortunately, this expedition didn't take place this year uh, it's because delayed of COVID. Because of corona. It's delayed. Yes, yeah. Yeah. But it will take place again. And um, so this is important, the innovative part, but also the monitoring part uh, is important because you have to have long um, ranges of data to compare with each other what is happening on the poles. So I think it should be definitely be, be remain uh, a mix of both. Okay. Thank you uh, for, for now, uh, both of you. Uh, now it's time uh, to start the panel discussion with uh, youth representatives from uh, Norway as well as from the Netherlands. And of course you both can participate if you would like. The people who join us from uh, Norway are, uh, to begin with, uh, Stian Larsen. He is calling in from Tromsø, the largest city in Norway's Arctic, where he is an advisor to uh, the county council. But he grew up in Hammerfest, I understand, the northernmost uh, town in the world. Uh, welcome. Uh, and also, Anja Maria, uh, we spoke to you earlier. Uh, she is calling in from Bode and studying in Trondheim, where she is, um, uh, no, she is currently studying in Trondheim, but she grew up in Kautokeino, I hear, in the heartland of uh, the northern Sami. And in the Netherlands, we speak to Bina Cirino, she stays in Utrecht, Marije Tempel, we saw you before in Groningen, and Matthijs Olde in The Hague, Den Haag. My first question is for Stian Larsen, advisor at Tromso Kanto County Council. Um, Stian, um, you work there um, in this uh, area. Uh, can you maybe first tell us how is it to live over there above the Arctic Circle? Well, it's it's quite wonderful, um, or else I wouldn't be here. <laughs> okay, but uh, when from a Dutch perspective, it's rather cold and dark now in December. Is that right? Yeah, it's from it's cold and dark from a Norwegian perspective as well. <laughs> Okay, uh, you are, uh, as I said, an advisor. Uh, you are an advisor on international business development and industry. So what do you think uh, should be the priorities for the future of the Arctic? Well, maybe I should start with a little bit of a background about the big changes and development in the Arctic over the last decades. So the Norwegian Arctic um, over the last decades has faced a lot of economical and social growth. So Tromso is one of the biggest cities. Um, well, it, it is the biggest city in Northern Norway with 80,000 inhabitants. And as board said before, 400,000 Norwegians live above the Arctic Circle. Um, and, and I think a good example of the economical growth the region has faced um, in the last decades uh, is the example of my hometown of Hammerfest. So, during the 60s, all the way throughout the 90s, um, Hammerfest is a, it, it's a small coastal city, um, northmost city in the world. Um, and during the 60s, throughout the 90s, it employed around 2,000 people in the um, local fishing processing facility. So a lot of the smaller communities around northern Norway uh, were based on fishing industry. So... Um, the globalization opened up new world markets and the jobs all of a sudden disappeared. So um, during the, the beginning of the 2000s, um, Hammerfest was at its lowest in terms of inhabitants um, and was facing quite a, quite a big um, downward facing spiral. Then the Norwegian government um, decided or agreed to establishing the LNG processing facility, Snow White. Um, and I do know oil and gas are controversial topics, but the, ef the economical effects it brought to Hammerfest and the snowball effects from this created new jobs, new schools, um, cultural life blossomed, 
young people moved back and the community grew. And today, Hammerfest is a medium-sized city in, in northern Norway. So to answer your question, yes, it is nice to live here. I'm able to both live my life, have a career, um, do the things I enjoy. And I think all the, all the aspects of modern living can be met in the Arctic. And you think, uh, when I hear you right, that economic development for the region should be one of the biggest priorities? <laughs> well, I do, but but we need also need to take in consideration um, that the Arctic can be many things. It, it's pristine and untouched nature, but it's also a modern, developed society. And I and I think in able to to make people want to come here, stay here, and live their lives, we need to have some sort of economical development as well. So from a society point of view, the biggest challenges facing the Norwegian Arctic today, except of course the climate change, is the access to, to a workforce. So our biggest asset is our people, but our biggest challenge is that we need more. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so before the, the COVID pandemic, uh, unemployment rates were, were quite low. And in many ways it was difficult for businesses to, to attract people and especially within the social and healthcare services and the construction industry. So um, most of our businesses in the region are small to medium sized. Um, so in order to grow, they need the right people with the right background. And also um, the region, as well as I think mostly of the, the, the sparsely populated areas in the Arctic are struggling with a decline in population. So um, young people especially, but also, oh, grown people um, move away to work and live other places. And, and this is a, ne a negative trend that is, it's, it's very hard to combat, but it is something we need to focus on. Okay, thank you so much for this, uh, this answer. Now I would like to ask a question to Bina Cirino. She is the president of Perspectief, and that is the youth organization of the Christen Unie, a political party in the Netherlands, which is uh, also part of our government right now. Bina, how do you look at this from a Dutch perspective? Hi, well, as we've uh, seen in the clips, it's, the, it's a beautiful lively region, as uh, Stian just stated. Um, that needs to be protected from both sides. Um, so when it comes to the future of uh, the Arctic environment, I believe that the measures uh, to limit global climate change is the most important from the Dutch perspective, because this is something that we can and have to con contribute to, um, as we all depend on the future of the Arctic environment. Um, so it's good to hear that uh, the Dutch strategy will focus uh, greatly on sustainability uh, and on research, but in light of recent numbers about whether we are on, on track with the Paris Agreement goals, uh, I do worry about that. Yeah, And you visited the northern part of uh, the Norway a year ago. Uh, did this trip change your views uh, on the development of the Arctic? Uh, definitely, yes. Uh, I, I had the privilege of visiting last year. Um, that definitely changed my views because there are a lot of factors that I didn't take into account. Um, so uh, how highly populated the area is, um, the complexity of uh, different things that need to be account when it comes to um, uh, sustainable energy, for example, uh, and indigenous peoples, uh, which is something that we in the Netherlands don't have a lot of experience with. Um, so uh, how quickly climate change is visible in that area is something that I could see as I was in the area. Um, so I felt the sense of, of urgency, and I think that is something that the ambition needs to be focused on more. Okay, well, let us return to Norway now and ask Anja Maria. Uh, we saw you before. Uh, you are st a master's student uh, at the Department of Geography, and you know a lot about Sami people, the indigenous population. What do uh, the Sami people notice uh, from the developments in the Arctic? Well, we definitely notice a large focus and interest uh, in the Arctic from the rest of the world. Um, I have grown up in the Arctic and I also see my future in the Arctic and it's important that sustainable development and, uh, and Arctic policy happens on the premises of the people who live there. And it's important for me that there is focus on keeping the Arctic uh, livable also in the future. 
Yeah, now, now uh, as I said, uh, there are big changes in the area you live. Uh, Norway, Norway, for instance, wants a lot of uh, windmills there and a railway. Uh, so how does this affect the Sami people? The green transition can be seen as a double burden for Sami people because there is climate change, but also the measures to prevent or mitigate climate change can have a negative e effect. For example, the call for more renewable energy and windmills are a big problem for Sami livelihoods, like the Sami reindeer husbandry, because the wind industry parks take up important uh, grazing areas from reindeer husbandry. 40% of Norway's land area is reindeer husbandry area, and uh, there are not only windmills, but other land use changes that fragmentate grazing areas and fragmentate uh, coherent nature in the Arctic. And to prevent this double burden, I think that it's important that some perspectives um, are a part of policymaking and also that climatic and environmental measures uh, are seen together uh, because it's no use saving the climate if there is no nature left for future generations. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, also online is Marije Tempel. Uh, we also saw you before. Um, uh, you know a lot about uh, cl climate change in the Arctic. Um, do you, Marije, have the impression that the perspective of, of young people is uh, uh, given sufficient attention by countries like uh, Norway or the Netherlands? Well, I do think that they are trying to give more and more attention to those perspectives. But I think it is very important to keep looking um, if, you, if, you, if you give the, um, the right attention. So, um, for example, I'm trying to develop a product uh, for climate change education in the Netherlands. And what we are doing is constantly keep asking our target group, the high school students, um, if, they, if they think the product is is good and if it will help um, because we can we can come up with an idea to involve the youth but if that's not the right idea um, you 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 have to keep asking yourself that question all the time so i think it's a it's a great beginning to uh, use youth panels and to ask uh, young professionals about their opinion but i do think it is important to keep asking are we involving you in the right way yeah, and if you and would, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> well, I was wondering, if you would be the prime minister of uh, the Netherlands, what would you do? <laughs> that's a that's a huge question. Um, well, you have all the power now. <laughs> first of all, I would I would I would not accept the idea of climate adaptation and climate change versus. Uh, economic development so because those two go hand in hand and and what you see is that there is constantly a discussion about how can we still keep jobs going on and how can we still keep developing the Arctic as well but also protect the environment but I think that there's so many uh, great challenges and, and and innovations possible in climate adaptation and um, as you see like uh, Groningen where I come from we are trying to keep youth here as well because they all go away to, to big cities. And what we are trying to do is to change our character and, and become a, a center of innovation for sustainable energy. And I think um, as if I would be the prime minister, I would say there is so much more um, fortune in the knowledge uh, of indigenous people, for example, than you have in the limited resources of oil, for example. So yeah, I would definitely focus on that. And if I can just shortly add, um, I would say that, uh, I would say that the um, economic value of uh, climate adaptation, uh, is something that you can communicate much more to the youth. So for now, the, the, there is like uh, uh, the Norwegian youth is taking the Norwegian government to court, for example. Well, you should be proud of that, that they are doing that because it means that the Norwegian youth is actually involved. 
in, in your politics. And instead of trying actively to keep them being involved, they are already. So that's like a crazy amount of luck. So I should say, put everyone who's suing you actually uh, in those panels to advise you because I think that's that's so valuable and you're so lucky that you already have that. Yeah. Um, okay, well, maybe, you, maybe yes. uh, Marije, it's good to ask uh, maybe the ambassador or maybe Stian or uh, someone else uh, would like to respond to this? Sure, I, I, I agree with you, Marije. I really think uh, one thing that we see in the world now is uh, that we really need to protect and promote democracy. I am all for participation. I really hope and I really encourage all young people to be active in politics, to be active in NGOs, to make their opinions heard. That's incredibly important because uh, that's the only way that we can, can secure solutions that work for uh, as many people uh, uh, as possible. So take part, be active and, uh, and uh, make yourself uh, heard. But also maybe the aspect of uh, is it now contrary to each other, economic development and climate change, or can they go, uh, can they be to uh, a part of one another? I think that's what we're trying to achieve is exactly that, and I agree with that as well. I mean, there is n necess not necessarily uh, any opposition between economic development and, and uh, a green, sustainable future. I think one of the things uh, governments need to work on is technology, uh, technological developments that, that enable us to, to, uh, to uh, treat uh, nature and the environment with the greater uh, uh, respect uh, and with better results than, than what we've done so far. Okay. Um, maybe someone else who would like to respond to this issue, because otherwise we have another issue to, uh, to discuss. Uh, Stian, I saw your finger. I yeah, I'll have a comment to that. And I, I think that sustainable development is, is, is truly the key um, for the future of the Arctic. And although Norway is an is a oil and gas nation, we, we do make a lot of big steps towards green energy. Um, a specific example, for instance, would be the hydrogen um, focus in Balleborg, which has a huge both growth, percent, growth potential and job creation, but would also be important for the green transition. Um, and the region as well with space tech, research, education. So I don't think we, we should emphasize on having one or the other. We, we should focus on um, creating solutions that combine both. And, and I think the Norwegian government actually do that. Um, we can of course get better, but we're, we're headed in the right direction. That's good to hear. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, we are also in touch with uh, Matthijs Olde. We haven't heard you yet. Uh, you are from uh, Jonge Atlantici, and, uh, which is a platform for dialogue about the future of NATO. We have talked about environmental issues and sustainable development uh, of the region, but there's another important uh, issue, and this is also evident from the uh, Norwegian polis policy on the Arctic, uh, and it's about security. Um, Matthijs, can you tell us how come is this important, you think? Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, well, the main issue in the region is, of course, the livelihoods and climate and ecology. Uh, but for that to be, uh, to be, that to, to, be ha to happen, uh, we need a productive dialogue between the Arctic countries and the stakeholders, uh, which can only happen when all the participating countries can uh, cooperate. Uh, well, as we've seen, uh, it's, it's been a low tension region for the last couple of decades, uh, but this is changing due to the new uh, economic uh, opportunities and uh, invasion of Crimea, which led to other uh, mid tensions. And uh, we need more, uh, and we need, uh, oh, sorry. And uh, okay. for this to happen, uh, and we need uh, a certain state of deterrence and awareness from, uh, from also NATO. Uh, which can uh, happen. Yeah, because uh, you think, um, is NATO able to protect that area, to keep that area safe? Well, I, I don't think it's it's about cooperation. As the Arctic policy of Norway show, showed, uh, their strategy is similar as the Netherlands, uh, uh, for a big part of uh, relying on Article 5, uh, for which uh, NATO needs to be able to show, without threatening, uh, for instance, Russia, 
that are able to respond if there is any threat. Uh, and only in 2018, uh, a big military exercise, which uh, with an impressive 50,000 uh, military personnel uh, from uh, all over NATO, uh, was were, was moved rapidly towards uh, northern Norway, including uh, an, an, uh, an aircraft carrier from the US Second Fleet, uh, to show that they are able. Uh, these operations, however, do need to show that they're not being used as a threat towards uh, Russia. Uh, and even with the diminishing uh, communication with Russia following the Crimean invasion, you've seen that if that Norway uh, and the Arctic Council is still able to have constructive dialogue. And I think that's uh, an important uh, issue to keep it that way. Yeah, you, you mentioned Russia. Uh, I'm not sure how many years ago it was, but I remember uh, to see Russia planting a flag on the bottom of the Arctic, uh, uh, beneath the uh, ice of the uh, geographical North Pole. Um, so the question is, um, there's of course still a lot of oil and gas in this Arctic region, and that is now becoming achievable because of the the melting of the ice. So um, does this also play a role in, in the tension maybe between the Arctic countries? Well, what we've seen is that uh, that's due to the climate change, uh, uh, the resources of the area and also shipping uh, options have become more feasible. At the same time, you've seen that countries like Russia are heavily, are also trying to change uh, towards a, a new form of uh, economy, uh, which includes exploit possible exploiting and uh, using shipping routes uh, along uh, the Northern uh, Passage. Uh, this black flanding was obviously uh, a, a big uh, PR stunt uh, at the same time, I think it's a message that they are very serious about it. Uh, they have started to, uh, to, uh, to uh, they have ordered six new uh, icebreakers, which is a very uh, important asset in the, in the region. Uh, and of course, Russia has already opened, reopened a number of uh, large Air Force bases uh, within the Polar Circle. Uh, so yeah, they, they are very, very serious about it. Uh, and, but I don't think that we should just necessarily take this as a threat because Russia has still shown to be a uh, to be uh, uh, open and to be transparent at least in this uh, uh, in this uh, uh, part of the world. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, the countries like uh, Norway, but also uh, NATO in general, uh, needs to show that we're uh, aware and capable in this uh, area. Maybe a question for uh, Mrs. Takaule, uh, because all these shipping routes Matthijs is telling us about are becoming, a uh, are becoming uh, how do you say that, uh, uh, ships can go uh, through uh, the, the Arctic uh, passi passage. We have a big harbor in the Netherlands, so how important is it also for our uh, harbor? That's a very interesting question, and it's something indeed we are currently um, uh, uh, working on and 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 and, and mapping. Um, what I what I read is is that uh, when when the Northern Sea Route um, uh, becomes saleable, um, and there are a, a lot of things uh, why it, it, that are still in the way, like the weather conditions, and can uh, some of the of the of the goods can they uh, um, uh, arrive on on time? That's really important. So if it's if it's if it is saleable um, uh, and all the co conditions are being fulfilled, uh, then it can be. Um, um, uh, some of the reports say that it that that two thirds of the of the goods that are currently being shipped uh, through the Suez Canal were, are being shipped through the Northern Sea Route. So it can be very interesting. But I think it, it it's still a long long way to go before it is really a feasible route and a really an alternative towards the but Suez Is Canal. that the case? Because we heard in this news item earlier this afternoon, we saw Peter kuipers Munneke. he's a weather forecaster at the NOS, and he said if this trend continues, then in 14 years, f 15 years, uh, the North Pole will be ice-free in summer, totally yeah. ice-free. That, that is correct, uh, um, but there are a lot of other conditions that need to be fulfilled as well um, to uh, make the ship route uh, a success. For instance, there need to be uh, th there needs to be a, a lot of uh, infrastructure that is not there at the moment, and that needs to be created. 
Um, and, and also the, the weather conditions, you know, it can be ice free, but if it's still storming all the time and there are icebergs on the way, uh, how sure can you be that the goods arrive on time in your harbor? Mm -hmm. So I think indeed the, the, the route can be ice free between 2030 and 2050, those are the estimations. But for it to become a success, there are a lot of other uh, fulfillments uh, to be made. Okay, Mr. Ambassador, would you like to comment on this? Yeah, uh, I, uh, I agree very much with what Liz is, is saying. I mean, yes, there are big uh, perspectives here, but there is also a lot of uncertainty. And the exact number of years, I think, is very, very difficult to, to, to kind of know, know precisely. What we do know is that the, the perspectives uh, are there, and, it, and it's certainly uh, an option. Uh, I'd like to get back a little bit to, to uh, Russia and what Matthijs uh, talked about. Uh, Russia is Norway's uh, biggest neighbor. They are by far the largest Arctic nation with, with huge territories in the Arctic. Uh, now, bilaterally, Norway has uh, enjoyed uh, pragmatic relations with Russia. We work very well with them in the north on fisheries management, environmental issues, nuclear safety issues, uh, and so on. And this practical cooperation also is reflected on the people-to-people -people level. There are very good people-to-people -people contacts between people in northern Norway and, and uh, people on the, Pol uh, on the Kola uh, Peninsula. Uh, at the same time, we see, as, as Matthijs indicated, that Russia has changed its behavior in global politics over the last uh, years, become more assertive, uh, in some ways more uh, aggressive, uh, and this uh, has impacts on Norway as a Western uh, country, as a country that is firmly based in uh, NATO, uh, that contributes to, to NATO, to our collective security, but we also depend on NATO to, to, to uh, ensure our uh, security. Uh, so we follow very closely uh, the Russian military build-up uh, in uh, the north, uh, and uh, we will, of course, not want to find ourselves in a situation where we are uh, unprepared, so that's another uh, issue. Uh, you asked me earlier on about, uh, about uh, you know, uh, possible uh, lessons or possible uh, messages that Norway would like to, to, to give to the world, and, and when it comes to security, our message is very clear. We have a stable and predictable good security situation now, and it's uh, in everybody's interest and it's everybody's responsibility that this uh, continues. continues. And yeah. is, is the outside world, again, this question then, is the outside world enough, uh, uh, is there enough awareness about this? I think that there is a lot of interest, there's a lot of awareness. Sometimes I think we run into the myth that things are, in fact, much worse than they are. I have read a number of articles, you know, saying that uh, there is a race for, for the Arctic, that, uh, you know, there's a great danger of, of uh, military confrontation and so on. A lot of people are interested in, in Chinese uh, advancements uh, in the Arctic. Uh, and I think it's easy to, to become too kind of uh, oriented towards uh, conflict and, and risk when uh, the reality is that the Arctic, even today, is actually one of the most stable and predictable uh, regions in the world when you look at it from a, a security policy uh, point of view. Okay, well, a question to uh, Stian. Uh, uh, is there is uh, d this this uh, whether or no tension uh, between Russia and Norway? Is it something you you notice uh, where you live? Well, I think Bord has a has a pretty good point, um, and I think the the uh, level of of tension um, depends on who you ask and what what type of level of organization you you might be, but. I think we, we should emphasize and focus on the posi positive aspects of cross-border collaboration. So, board mentioned the distribution of fishing quotas. Um, uh, we do a lot of uh, cross-border exchange of culture and business development. So, the people-to-people -people contact is good. And, and I think that's the main um, way we, we kind of sense that, it, you know, it, it's, it's good contact, but the militarized... Um, issues are there, but it's not something I think about from day to day, in my everyday life. No, that's good. And Anja, how is it for you? Anja Maria. Um, yeah, same for me. I don't really think about these issues uh, in my day to day life, but also what I observe is that there is a lot of focus on cross-border cooperation, people to people cooperation, and uh, this I think is very positive and also it's very important uh, for uh, Sami people who are divided in four different nations that there is a lot of cross-border uh, cooperation. 
Okay. And m maybe now a question to Marije, uh, Marije Tempel. Um, how did you experience uh, international cooperation uh, on Svalbard? Um, maybe also with, for example, the Russians. Did you, did you feel any tension at all? Um, well, Svalbard is, of course, a very um, special place when you when you talk about all the different uh, nationalities packed together there. Um, I do think that it is actually really nice to see that um, on Svalbard, especially on Longyearbyen, where I lived, there is a lot of um, uh, interaction between different cultures and uh, uh, the Russian choir, for example, would like come to Longyearbyen to uh, to sing there and to share their their culture. Uh, same with the with the huge Thai community uh, in Longyearbyen. Um, but yeah, sometimes on Svalbard you got the feeling that uh, uh, um, there is like economic uh, freedom there, so you can just like um, go to Svalbard and start your business if you if your country signed the Svalbard Treaty. Um, and what you see is that like um, maybe mostly the Russians sometimes feel um, that they don't benefit in the same way as the Norwegians living on Svalbard uh, because of the uh, Norwegian policies uh, there. And of course, Norway also wants to uh, um, keep their physical presence uh, right on Svalbard as well. So I do think that there are certainly two different levels to, to look at the uh, cooperation. So you have the local level where people are just sharing and interacting different cultures, traditions, and um, and you have the level of cooperation um, uh, of, of, of security in more emergency uh, situations. So if, if, if someone has to be rescued, there is like a lot of cooperation, I think, but you also have the more geopolitical uh, level. And I think on that level, um, countries are more competing with each other. So um, competing in the way of like the strategic strategic value of the Arctic is growing, and um, with all the uh, resources that um, that people can exploit, um, there there is certainly competition. But I I won't say that it's already uh, in the danger zone. No. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, uh, 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 Mr. Svensson, Ambassador, um, you mentioned China before. Huh? We have discussed Russia now, but how about China? What's the interest of China in the Arctic? China is a huge nation. Uh, they um, are uh, very interested in the, the perspective, uh, I think, economic uh, uh, resources uh, in the Arctic. They have uh, they have quite um, significant uh, scientific presence in Svalbard, for instance. In in New Orleans, in China, is present. They they show a lot of interest uh, when it comes to to scientific uh, research, for instance. Uh, at the same time, again, I think it's important not to uh, dramatize uh, things. Uh, we follow the, uh, the, the, the Chinese presence in the northern areas in, in the Arctic quite closely. If you look at realities, uh, it's still on a fairly limited uh, level, certainly in, in the, the western countries of the Arctic. Of course, in Russia, they have huge investments in the energy sector and, and, and so on. But uh, uh, but I think uh, for now uh, there is little need to, to as I said, uh, kind of uh, overdramatize this uh, this um, situation. Okay. Well, I think now it's time to check uh, uh, if people in the audience have questions. Uh, maybe we can have a look at the chat on YouTube. Um, yes, I can uh, see a question from Björn. Björn, is it Willy Robstad to Ambassador Svensson and Mrs. Terkuyle? Can you elaborate on how Norway and the Netherlands cooperate in the polar regions? Maybe for you first, Mr. Kuyle, Mrs. Terkuyle. <laughs> yes, of course. Now I know we uh, we are conducting a lot of uh, research together, so that that is uh, 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 I think a very 
a good thing. I know the ambassador just visited the Arctic Center in, in Groningen, uh, Universiteit Groningen. So that is uh, what we do also in, in here in, in the Netherlands. We work closely together with, with the embassy and uh, uh, on my behalf. So that is, uh, that is very good. And the, uh, the embassy of the Netherlands in, uh, in Oslo is also following the, the, the Arctic developments uh, very well and receives a lot of information from Norwegian si Nordic, uh, Norwegian side. So I think there that we work closely together on, on a range of, of, of subjects. Okay, so something you yes, would like uh, to comment? I agree wholeheartedly, and I think uh, I can just, uh, that's not the topic for, for today's discussion, but <laughs> Liz alluded to it. I mean, both the Netherlands and Norway are also very active in the Antarctic, right, in the s South yeah. Pole yes. areas, yeah. and we have quite a lot of, uh, of, of uh, good contacts there, both at the uh, scientific level and also at the, the political uh, level. Yeah, for the Netherlands, maybe the Antarctic is more important for mm. our future. <laughs> uh, when the ice is melting there, it should it should uh, give a direct mm. response uh, at our place. Okay, well, maybe I can ask if there are uh, other questions. Otherwise, we will continue our conversation. Um, let me see. No, not yet. Okay. Uh, well, uh, maybe it's good uh, that I can ask the, the panel uh, from the panel discussion, maybe the participants there. Oh, no, we, I can see there's another uh, question from Jonathan Verkuil to Liz Terkuilen. What are the expectations regarding the role of the Netherlands as an observer within the Arctic Council? Yeah, we, we didn't discuss this yet, so it's a very good question, I think. Uh, maybe it's it's good if you first um, give us a, 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 a what more information about why uh, uh, the Netherlands are a participant in the Arctic Council. Yes, that's that's a nice story to tell. So we've been active as one of the uh, uh, one of the first observers from the start, or even before the start of the Act Arctic Council or the foundation of the Arctic Council. We were already active in one of the working groups that later was absorbed in the Arctic Council. Um, and this has everything to do with our um, uh, concern and the will to contribute to the sustainable uh, development and especially the government of the Arctic. So currently we are um, uh, one of the, of the 13 observer countries uh, to the Arctic Council. And maybe it's, it's nice to tell a little bit about what, what this all entails. Uh, so yearly we have two uh, meetings, uh, uh, senior Arctic official uh, meetings, uh, and I go there on behalf of the Netherlands um, uh, which, which I, which I uh, find very interesting. Um, and the name observer tells a lot. So you observe the meeting. Um, but there are also elements where the... Um, uh, Does it mean you're not really participating? Yeah. So what you, what you see is there's a table uh, uh, where all the Arctic countries, so the eight, eight Arctic countries are, are, are sitting, and also the, um, uh, uh, the, the five permanent participants. Um, so that are the delegations and the, head, the heads of the, uh, of the indigenous, uh, different indigenous communities. So they are on the, they are on the, uh, uh, on the round table and discussing everything. And we as observer countries are sitting next to that, that, that table and we are observing the meeting. So that is quite literally observing, but of course there are also the working groups, and in the working groups we can contribute, actively contribute, and we can uh, uh, s uh, speak our minds. So there are several ways in on which the observers can contribute to the work of the Arctic Council. But now the question, I forgot what it was. Do ah, you, do you still another remember? Question. No, this, this is another question. The, the involvement of the Netherlands as an observer to the Arctic Council, how uh, I think the Netherlands can use that. Yeah, uh, and maybe maybe the that. future expectations already, yeah. because the question maybe also is, is this Arctic Council uh, sufficient enough to deal with all the challenges in the Arctic region? Maybe a question for you both. Yeah, yeah. maybe to start off with, uh, uh, I think uh, the Arctic Council is sufficiently equipped um, and I think it is important that also maybe security issues uh, will not be dis discussed in the Arctic Council. So um, I, I see the Arctic Council as really the main uh, 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 governance or cooperation structure for the Arctic. And uh, so it, it, it will work well enough to deal with all these great problems we've discussed already. I think so. Okay, and now the question for you, because how does Norway regard the Dutch presence in the Arctic Council? Uh, just to, to start off with, I mean, Norway also sees the Arctic Council as being incredibly important. Before I came to the Netherlands amb as ambassador, I was Norway's representative in the Arctic Council as Norway's senior Arctic official, and, and uh, that was an incredibly 
uh, educational experience. The Arctic Council and especially the six working groups, they do a lot of really high level, high quality uh, research uh, on all the issues that we've talked about uh, today uh, that deal with the environment and, and uh, climate. And it's a really good, uh, I think, example of successful uh, international uh, cooperation that we uh, as, as a state definitely want to see it continued. So the answer to the question, we are very positive uh, about uh, the Netherlands' presence uh, and, uh, and activities in the Arctic Council, the active participation in, in the working groups, the fact that Dutch uh, scientists uh, provide a lot of really uh, good research that, that is important for, for future policy uh, making. Uh, the other part of the question, what about other European countries, most recently Estonia queuing up to join in uh, 2021? Uh, I'll just repeat that uh, we, uh, Norway, is, is, is happy and, and uh, glad to see uh, a keen interest of other countries in Arctic uh, uh, matters uh, when it comes to taking up new observers uh, to the Council. This is something that is decided at the ministerial meetings and all of the eight uh, member states have to be uh, in agreement. Uh, consensus is, is uh, what uh, is, is the, uh, the rule of the day in the uh, Arctic uh, Council. Uh, countries that wish to become observer states uh, to the Arctic Councils, they have to fulfill certain criteria. The most important one is that they have to be able to document that they take part already in the, uh, the work of the working groups. Uh, that's, uh, that's an important uh, criteria. Okay, but I can understand uh, as we move forward with this uh, um, uh, with a region that is that is going to change and, and change further on uh, with with uh, even more uh, even lower uh, uh, amounts of ice that the, the 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 number of problems you will have to face are growing mm. yes I, I think there will certainly <laughs> not be a lack of of issues that the Arctic Council has to deal with in, in the, the years uh, to come yeah, okay. I saw a lot of other questions uh, just a moment ago. Uh, there's Yu Wang to all panelists. Do the panelists feel that there should be more support from the government and society for social sciences and humanities research in the Arctic? Is there someone, uh, maybe one of you or one of the people on the panel who would like to respond to this question? If nobody's, uh, yeah. Marije, okay, please, go ahead. Well, from my own experience, I studied uh, human geography. And uh, so for my master thesis, I um, had contact with UNIS, for example, that's the um, un university center uh, on Svalbard. And um, as a social scientist, it's really hard to, uh, to get a place in, uh, in Arctic research centers like that. Um, so they couldn't offer me any uh, possibilities to, to work together because they focus what? much more on the natural side of, uh, of science there. And why, why was that so, or why is that so difficult? Well, I, I do think that um, the, the, the social relevance uh, and the economic relevance uh, of the Arctic is is not maybe not so clear yet in 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 some research. So it's mo it's more more like is said before um, about the untouched wilderness and and not so much on the um, uh, well the, the the chances of globalization and uh, the impact of uh, climate change on society. I think that there could be much more research on that as well. Okay. Anybody, uh, any one of you who would like to comment on this? I think I can say, I mean, I've said a lot about the, the importance of science and research, and I think uh, Norway is certainly one of the, the Arctic countries that tries to do a lot to make sure that there is enough funding, in, enough money available for uh, high quality uh, science and, uh, uh, and research. Uh, of course, there's always a, a, a debate. I mean, uh, uh, in, in a sense, th there's never enough. I mean, there's, there's always more that can be done. There's always more that can be, be, be given. But certainly from our national perspective, I, I think we are doing a, a pretty decent job at uh, securing uh, s uh, sufficient funding uh, for, for this sector. Uh, sorry, the, there's one thing I, I'm not really understanding right uh, yet. You say there's always debate. Mm. Why is that? I, I think because these issues are very big. I mean, uh, you are you are talking about very basic questions of of uh, 
you know, it, it continued uh, existence uh, in, in the Arctic. Of course, uh, for us, uh, first and foremost, of, of the people living there, but also of, of biodiversity, uh, animals, plants, and so on, you know, uh, th these are big issues. So it, it's natural, I think, that, uh, that uh, people will want to push for as much uh, knowledge and as much uh, solid science as, as possible. Okay. Anybody from the panel yeah. who would like to respond to this? Yeah, Bina? Mm -hmm. um, yes, I definitely think that uh, there should be more research on the social part. Um, as Maria uh, said, uh, it sounds quite difficult um, to see what the effect is uh, of uh, people in the area. And as it is a region that will um, be a lot more easy to reach for a lot of people when it comes to uh, sustainable jobs or for tourism, I think it's definitely important to see um, what the effect is on the region with a lot more people going there. Yeah, especially tourism, I think. We, we haven't especially discussed tourism. tourism yet, but uh, it's, of course, you can imagine that things will change uh, drastically in the coming decades. Definitely, uh, in a sense of security, in a sense of pollution yeah. uh, that is coming with that. Yeah, Maria, you also raised your hand. Yeah, just quickly to add on what's said before about, for example, the sustainable energy and the impact on uh, societies in the high north, like uh, like wind farms. Um, you often see that there are uh, natural impact assessments, but uh, social impact assessments to see how policies that are implemented and, and, and sustainable uh, energy strategies uh, that are implemented, how they affect the society. I think uh, that's something you can, if you assess that beforehand and do research about that and see the relevance of that research, you can, uh, it's also economically very beneficial. Yeah, you mean also how it affects indigenous people like the Sami. Maybe that is something that uh, Marie, uh, uh, sorry, um, Anja Maria could respond to? Do you think there should be more research how, how it, it will affect the, uh, the people? Yeah, I definitely. I agree with Maria Mari that um, also like the human aspect and social uh, impacts of uh, land use, for example, must be um, also valued and, and studied. And also indigenous knowledge uh, it's very important here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, is there anyone, uh, maybe, oh, there's uh, one more question from the audience from Stella Letchert uh, to Ambassador Svensson. Could you uh, elaborate on current dem uh, demographic, demographic issues up north and how does Norway envision tackling demographic issues in its latest High North White Paper? Thank you. That's a very, very good question. And this is a question that is indeed, I think, addressed quite extensively in, in the, the white paper. Uh, and uh, this was already alluded to the fact that uh, we see, in spite of the fact that we've had good economic growth in northern Norway over the past few years, we still see that uh, more people are moving away than are moving uh, to uh, the northern uh, regions. And, and that is not good. That is something that uh, is certainly not in the interests of the of the uh, Norwegian state, the Norwegian uh, government. Uh, of course, uh, there are a number of uh, incentives uh, for people to go in and uh, live and work in northern Norway. For instance, uh, things like uh, tax uh, uh, reductions and and some some extra benefits. Uh, those uh, arrangements will definitely need to to uh, continue. And I think uh, the, the challenge for the government will be to to contribute to making life in the north as it attractive as possible so that uh, so that we don't see this uh, this uh, increase in uh, in uh, in people moving uh, moving uh, away but there's how, so how big is this increase can you give us some uh uh, oh, I'm, I'm very bad with numbers, Elaine, <laughs> but uh, uh, we have traditionally said uh, that 10% of the Norwegian population live uh, above the Arctic Circle. Now it's gone down to, I think, 9.1 or, or 9.2. So and I think is it because, uh, w because we uh, in the Netherlands we have the same, of course, that a lot of young people want to go to big cities? I think that's uh, that's uh, part of it. Yeah. Uh, is to to uh, I mean, uh, kind of the attraction of of the central areas uh, versus uh, 
versus some of the, the regions. That's uh, it's probably it's part of it. Yeah, sorry, it's, it's, it's uh, more opposite than what you would think. You would think the, the area is becoming more uh, uh, profitable, more economic change, uh, changes because mm. of the, 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 the climate change, uh, but that's not the case mm. then. No, uh, the, the numbers, you know, they, they speak a clear language. So yeah. as I said, even though we've had a, a number of uh, incentives that I think are very good, very positive, even though there is continued investment, we sti still see this uh, tendency. And uh, I, I'm not sure that there is a quick fix, but it will remain very uh, high, uh, high on the agenda. High, yes, high numbers. OK. Yeah. Well, maybe um, there is one more question. Yu Wang to Lister Kuilen. Could you tell us uh, some more about the Dutch perspective on international cooperation with other non-Arctic uh, actors such as China and South Korea in the Arctic, in the Arctic Council, I think, uh, uh, is what Yeah, the interesting means. question. Yeah. Um, I don't know, is it about international cooperation on the Arctic specifically? Then I can elaborate a little bit on that. Um, because indeed in the uh, Arctic uh, Council working groups we work together with other researchers also of the observer countries uh, that are in the in the working groups so also on Ch with China and uh, uh, South Korea um, and uh, I, I think we're open on, on, on collaborating with with all uh, relevant countries on the Arctic and our researchers always looking are looking for uh, interesting partners to cooperate with so um, yeah and do you think maybe in the future, um, I can imagine that the non-Arctic partners will maybe think, well, shouldn't we get a bigger role in the Arctic Council? That's a question that is sometimes raised, yes. I mean, Liz yeah. already explained the, the arrangement in the Arctic Council. You have eight uh, uh, member states, you have the, the permanent participants, the indigenous organizations, uh, and then you have the uh, observers. Uh, at the moment, I don't think there's anything to indicate that these uh, structures will, will uh, change. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I said, uh, uh, we are working quite actively to, to refute this myth that the Arctic is not governed. It is governed. <laughs> I mean, the governance structures uh, are, are in place, and, and I think they are, they are working quite well. Uh, I, I think it's natural that the countries that are located in the Arctic are the main actors when it comes to governance. That doesn't exclude the fact that we're all interested in having extensive international cooperation and input from uh, a lot of other countries uh, in, in uh, science, uh, research, uh, political uh, cooperation. Yeah, but maybe because uh, I was thinking about uh, the shipping opportunities, mm -hmm. uh, uh, things like that, then other countries will be more interested in the future in the Arctic uh, region than nowadays or in, in history. Mm. Yes, I, I think they will be uh, involved, but as I said, when it comes to the, the, the governance issues, uh, I, I don't think it would be uh, in Norway's interest or in the interest of the Arctic nations uh, to, to uh, change, uh, change that. Okay, thank you. Um, well, Wouter Jan de Graaf, he is also uh, asking a question. Dear Ambassador Svensson, could you elaborate on both the international political opportunities and dangers for Norway as a result of the melting Arctic? Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> this is something that, that we've spent most of our time today uh, discussing. Uh, again, I think uh, it's in everybody's interest that there is great international interest to Arctic developments. Uh, and, and to participation, you know, that we all uh, do as much as possible to have as much knowledge as possible so that we can make the right uh, political uh, decisions. Uh, when it comes to uh, the dangers, uh, uh, some of them are, uh, are evident. Uh, there's no doubt that climate uh, change represents uh, dangers, both in terms of, uh, you know, changing uh, physical conditions, uh, uh, melting of the ice, melting of the, the permafrost. Uh, this uh, leads to, as I said, uh, landslides and avalanches, uh, wildfires and so on. Uh, these dangers are there and these dangers are real and they need to be, uh, be uh, dealt with. So uh, a lot of opportunity for extensive international uh, cooperation to, to meet these challenges and, and to, to make sure that these uh, dangers uh, don't uh, do us too much damage. Now, I asked you uh, both before uh, whether the, the perspective of the youth is, is enough uh, uh, respected in the governments of Norway and in uh, the Netherlands. But is that also the case in the Arctic Council? 
In the Arctic Council, there is a lot of uh, uh, discussion about the involvement uh, of youth. I think this is high on the agenda, both of the, uh, the member states, but also the indigenous organizations, the permanent participants, have, I think, done more in recent years to make sure that there are young people um, uh, being invited to join the official delegations uh, and uh, being invited to provide uh, uh, policy input when, when we uh, work out our different uh, positions. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, of course, uh, you can always have uh, more of that. I think the important thing is that we are conscious of this and that we try to do our part to, to make this uh, Maybe, this maybe that's an interesting question for uh, the, the members of our panel. Do you think uh, younger people should, ha should play a, a, a bigger role, a bigger part in this Arctic Council? Is there someone who would like to reflect on that? <laughs> yeah, Marije. Um, I think that um, it is most important to uh, um, first see how you can communicate more what is being discussed in the Arctic Council and uh, to translate to the classroom or to translate that to to, to younger people. And um, I think that will already help much more. The, the same, yeah, I think that you need to connect it more to, to the education. Um, but I don't know if, uh, if, if there is the need of more representation uh, directly in the Arctic Council of, of younger people. I would just say, <laughs> make a whole, Young, young party in the in the government, but that's <laughs> um, also a good yes, idea. No, and as well, maybe if I can add to that, there is also the Arctic Council Youth Simulation, mm -hmm. and I visited it once, and it was very, yeah, spectacular what was going on, uh, all the discussions that are being uh, that took took place. So there is. Um, uh, there is a lot going on with the Arctic Council and youth as well. But do you think that the perspective of younger people is different than from adults? Um, well, I guess the perspective from yo younger people is always different. And the perspective, uh, what we notice in the Netherlands is that the perspective of, uh, perspective of the young people is, um, is, is, is all about preventing climate change. And they want to, to shake us, do more to yeah. prevent this from happening. So I consider myself as relatively long, young, so I'm be in between somewhere. Okay, so you can imagine both uh, sides. Yeah. Okay. Um, may oh, Bina, Bina, you would like to comment on this? Uh, yes, I would like to comment because I, I think it's good that there are simulations. I think it's good that, you know, from afar, uh, young people can react to the situation. Uh, but when it comes to uh, direct participation, we see that a lot of young people don't know about the urgency of the situation, uh, that they are not being heard when it comes to uh, real adjustments. So, you know, there are these major protests, a lot of people going on the streets, um, but when it comes to uh, the strategies, I don't think that young people are being heard enough. Um, if we see that the, the ice in the, in the Arctic might melt in our generation, in our lifetime, that is something really big that we have to deal with. So I definitely believe that uh, for example, in the Arctic Council, young people should have a bigger role. Okay. Our time is running out, but maybe I can give you an opportunity to say some final words. One of you. <laughs> no, I just want to say that, it, that this is a very interesting session, and I really want to speak a little bit further with, with also the youth participants on how we can incorporate the, the, the youth position more also in our in our policies so, so this is actually an open invitation from my end let's stay in touch okay and Mr. Ambassador? yes I, I agree very much with that i've really enjoyed this uh, afternoon i think it's been a really good uh, discussion we've we've touched on a lot of different uh, issues uh, and I'll, I'll just repeat what i i said at, at one point uh, i really encourage all young people to be active in uh, in the you know, shaping our democracies. Take part in politics, take part in NGOs, you know, make your, your voices uh, heard. That is, uh, is uh, very, very uh, important. And when it comes to uh, the Arctic, uh, f for Norway uh, as, a, as a country, uh, as a state, uh, this will always remain a, a top uh, priority. And uh, we are very, very 
uh, uh, adamant uh, to, to, to make sure that, uh, that uh, we can continue to, to call the uh, Arctic our, our home. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everybody at home in Norway and the Netherlands and also in other countries, I understand, in Russia, in the United States and even in Spain, I heard. Thank you all very much for your presence this afternoon. And, of course, a special word of thanks to the Norwegian ambassador, uh, Bart Ivar Svensson, and the Dutch polar official, Liz Terkuyle, for coming to the studio here in Utrecht. Uh, everybody, uh, thank you again. Goodbye, uh, everybody, and have a nice day.